and Nosana, you're going to forgive me. Everybody will forgive me. I have a mentor who told me that artists must not talk so much, they must make art. So I'm rather going to show you. Show. <clears throat> I'm sitting on an upside down drum in your room, which is a shack. You are lying on the bed that burnt last week when you fell asleep with a cigarette in your hand. You were so sick, you were probably stoned as well. Your mother is sitting in the doorway, balancing her body to the left because the plastic chair she is sitting on only has three legs. I still smell the smoke residue in the room, that and the smells that hang around a deathbed. The Cape Town summer is beating down on the iron roof. There is no ceiling or thick pink fibers like at my house to navigate that heat away from us. The three of us are just together like this, feeling the heat, our skins glistening with sweat. Your body, or what's left of it, is struggling towards its death. I notice that you are lying under a piece of shimmery black net material, the kind meant for a ballerina's tutu. At first I think, wow, how queer and camp is that? To lie under material that is so associated with performances, and I tease you about it. Yes, white boy, I'm a queen to the end, you say. But this time, I'm sorry, it's my blanket in the heat and it keeps the flies off me. I feel the appropriate rich man's shame and I'm caught off guard by how soft your eyes are. I'm not used to this. I have looked down at you in hospital beds many times in the last year, but the fire was always in your eyes before, ready to fight with me. We like fighting so much, you and me. It's the thing that has taught us the most in our relationship. Our relationship has been so marked with the recognition of performances that happen between black people and white people, between poor people and rich people, between men and women. Who is going to perform sex worker stories for my camera now? Who is going to perform hunger and crisis to manipulate me for money and then confess the manipulation with the money in hand? We haven't had enough time to discuss our fights even. And now I'm sitting at your deathbed and you are in terrible pain and the cloud of morphine that the death nurses brought a few days ago. We aren't even talking, we are just sweating and you are moving in and out of your drowsy morphine naps and I'm wondering what to do with my feelings. Your mother gets up and leaves us alone. I feel relieved. Now I don't have to bear the politeness and the ingratiation that comes from her and how she, she responds to white people and to men with privilege. You have taught me to bear this and not to try and change it. While you sleep, I remember the last discussion we had about poverty performances, the things that we learned from Mona Lisa Traba. Me. Lee, why do people in the streets always use the same stories when they want money from us? Can't they come up with something new? I'd want to pay for something new. You say, wow, really, Robert? Something new doesn't work, okay? You are an activist, so know that you know what works for activism. They know what works in begging. Shut up. Me. So people actually believe that their stories are working. You, look at me, you looked at me smugly and you said, This is how life changes. Stories are big. Stories can just do so much. And then I said, Come on, Lee, that shit we work with when we are NGOs, trying to get people stories for reports and projects. You looked at me and then you went for the jugular. Wow, how many times have I told you about yourself, white man? You never listen to me, white boy. I'm appropriately shamed and I say, okay, yes. I remember, privileged people want to be blindfolded. They don't want the truth in that moment. And you said, yes, Robert. The minute they see, they are going to see, they are going to feel what's between them. And when they feel, it's going to pain them too. They don't know how to handle that pain, because they have money. And they just don't have that pain. Oh, come on, Lee. Everybody has pain. It's the human condition. You smile slyly at me again. Yes, but they think they don't have the pain because they have money, so they can buy out of the pain for long periods. They don't have to stick with the pain. So you're saying to me these performances between us hold back the pain that is between people. 
I remember feeling pissed off with humanity and thinking how we fight poverty, how would we fight poverty versus wealth? If we keep sustaining the system with our performances and we don't start hard hitting, difficult fighting conversation with one another that show the pain between us. And if privileged artists keep documenting these poverty performances, how does that change anything? You're coming out of one of your drowsy naps now. I'll ask you why you called me here. I thought we agreed that we don't love one another and that it's impossible to love or have friendship through so many barriers. You live in a shack, you're a sex worker, I live in a privileged neighborhood, I'm an artist, we're black, white, male, female, man, woman, we might be trans, but that doesn't mean anything. And I'm hoping that it'll infuriate you and bring you back to life, but it doesn't. Your eyes just become wet and you manage a small smile. I love you, Robert. Don't ever forget I'm a transgender woman. Make sure my mother doesn't bury me like a Muslim man. And you fall asleep again. It's your old joke that makes me very nervous. <laughs> uh, that's very difficult for me because the, ch the, the challenge for me is I've become the enemy. You know, I realized I was going to become the enemy as a male, but in the time that we're living in the world also, um, I'm a white male. And so for me, the challenge was to learn to listen, to know when to step back, to, um, to try and dilute whiteness in the process, but also not to make myself invisible, typically like, you know, privileged, white men come from the north and photograph black bodies. So I'm constantly living in that uncertainty. I try not to fight it, and just lean into it and, and, and learn. For me, it's very important to look at the power dynamic that I'm having with somebody. And in South Africa, race is always relevant there. I've only ever photographed um, the two bodies of work where black people were in it. And the first body of work were the George Gender sex workers and Lee that I did the big exhibition with. And it was very clear to me um, who needed to own that. The work belongs to them. It was developed as advocacy, not as a body of work for me. It took seven years to do it before everybody was happy with it. And all, all profits of the work goes to a fund for the support group. The other black person that's been in my work this is difficult. It's my daughter. And um, <laughs> that took a very long time to actually include it, but I thought it was an important conversation to be, to be had. And uh, I don't know if she'll um, appreciate that or if it, anything will come from it, but any of that work I put into a fund for her for when she, she grows up. And those were images also belong to her. But this is a difficult thing, right? That work has sold. So my question is, this is the thing with art. It's not like a song where you retain the copyright of it. The moment the artist that has editions sell their work, you can't own it anymore. And after I realized that too late, I kind of regretted it, that I hadn't waited, that I had exhibited that work when she was older and could engage with it. You know, transgender women who are sex workers, you're they are beautiful. And sometimes when you see them in the day, you think, you just walk past, you don't see them. But when they work at night, essentially sex work is a performance. They are actresses. And so, to do their work, they need the other character on the stage, the client. Okay. And when I started working with uh, the Sister Zood, that was my role, I was the client. They would perform all the sexy stuff that they do, and I would pay them. But that was just in the beginning. And as the years, as we worked, and they became feminists, and they became worthy fighting adversaries for me, we had lots of lovely fights, um, they started saying to me, and you, you're not the client anymore. We know about this representation stuff. You could take your clothes off also. I was like, oh, I'm old man, I'm ugly. Who wants to look at some fat old white guy? I'm like, no. <laughs> they were like, no. You taught us this. We, we, not, you didn't teach us this. We learned this together. Take off your clothes. So anyway, so we did a project where we made a video where I undressed together with Lee. 
was this performance between us. And it was total nudity. And then I said, are you happy now? And I showed it to them. And they were like, ah, oh, you were right. Can you please show that one in the dark? Don't put it next to ours. <laughs> and that's how it ended up. It was a video that was shown sort of at the side of the exhibition that not too many people had to look at it. Make of that what you want. <laughs> I'm trying to learn something from you today, but it's not so easy. <laughs> but this question made it easy. What makes it worth it for me to keep on in this difficult time is the continuing, continuing patience and love and strange curiosity that black people have. I still get welcomed. I'm still here between you. And I can just say thank you very much. It is a difficult time we're all living and you, you make it worth it. <laughs>